This is Chatter. I'm Matt Gluck. This week, journalist and novelist David Ignatius on Phantom Orbit. I think the honest truth, Matt, is that the reason the U.S. Space Force was created was because the Air Force dropped the ball. It just didn't take space seriously enough. What gives the United States special opportunities and also difficulties is that what's most dynamic in our space array is actually in the private sector. The first Gulf War taught everybody about the importance of precision weapons and everybody follow. This is a drone war. Don't think that drones won't operate in every battle space on the planet in the future because of what people are sort of watching in Ukraine. David Ignatius, welcome to Chatter. Congratulations on your excellent and engrossing book. To get us started, could you describe how you settled into a career um, that, as you write in the acknowledgments of uh, Phantom Orbit, has allowed you to pursue the twin paths of fiction and fact? So settle in is doesn't feel like quite the right word. Uh, yeah. I published my first novel in 1987. Uh, I, at that point, had been uh, a journalist for the Wall Street Journal for about 10 years. I'd covered the Middle East for the Wall Street Journal. And in the course of that, I'd come across a story that appeared on the front page of the journal about how the CIA had recruited Arafat's, Yasser Arafat, then leader of the PLO, leading terrorist group at the time, had recruited his chief of intelligence as an American asset and had run him for 10 years uh, until he was assassinated by uh, Israel. They made no secret of it. He, they regarded him, from their perspective, quite uh, understandably as a terrorist. But he had been working with the CIA and had saved, I reckon, hundreds, thousands of American lives in the work that he did for the U.S. So I wrote this novel. Um, the, the way I fell into all the information after the story was published on the front page, basically surrounds the bombing of the American embassy in Beirut. I was in the embassy the day it was hit, and all of the, many of the Arab assets who had been recruited by people who died in the building sought out somebody to talk to. So it was me. So, you know, so I write the book. And then I had a dilemma of whether uh, to give up my journalism and become a novelist. The book was very well received. It was, it was the true story of what the CIA had been doing in the Middle East with all these incredible moral complications. Sh should I focus on that and try to be the best novelist I could, or should I s stick with journalism, which I loved and been doing for 10 years? And I couldn't decide. That's why it doesn't feel like I settled into it. I, I was really um, struggling with the decision, and I, I, I couldn't choose one or the other, over the other. I was afraid I could never be a commercial novelist and make enough money to support my family. I had two kids at that point. So I didn't choose, and I decided I'd do them both. And that's what I've continued to do from 1987 to now. This is my 12th novel. I've continued working as a journalist for more than 20 years. I've been a columnist for The Washington Post, and I also do these books. And as I say in the acknowledgments, I'm glad I didn't choose because to have given up uh, one or the other um, would have made for me a much less satisfying life and career. And how does Phantom Orbit, your newest book, which I highly recommend to all listeners, uh, how does it fit into uh, the narrative of your career? So each of my books really, uh, Matt, uh, in some ways is an elaboration of something that's interested me in my journalism. And I got fascinated several years ago with space weapons, space warfare, uh, I'd written a, a series of novels sort of looking at likely future key technologies for national security. Um, one called The Director, just about uh, cybersecurity and hacking. Then one called The Quantum Spy, about quantum computing and the battle between the U.S. and China. One about uh, deep fakes called, called Paladin. I was trying to think, like, what, what is the next thing that we're all going to be worrying and wondering about? And it seemed obvious that... Uh, space systems was was at the top of that list. So I had the idea that I wanted to, uh, to try to write a book in that area. I did more and more journalism. Uh, 
I also had the idea that I wanted to write a novel about Russia. Um, and that predated the war in Ukraine. I actually I had the idea of trying to have as a main character uh, a Russian who, whose life had been crushed after the fall of the Soviet Union. Uh, and I, I thought it'd be really interesting to have a Russian from the Russian version of Pittsburgh. We think of the, kind of the ghost towns of, of our Rust Belt. What would the Russian version of that be like? Um, so I applied for a visa. I was going to go to Magnitogorsk, which is a city that figures in the book, which is the Russian Pittsburgh, and just do reporting there on the scene. And along comes the Ukraine war. Um, I was was there uh, two or three, I guess, three times in that first year uh, of the war. And, and along the way, I got put on the ban list by Russia. I can't, I am legally forbidden to travel to Russia. So my visa got canceled. I never got to go to Magnitogorsk. So I had to invent this, but I still had, as I say in the book, um, there's a way in which this novel, which has a Russian character, Russian scientist who discovers something frightening about what he thinks um, uh, may be ahead in, in space warfare. Uh, but I, I say in the acknowledgments, this book is a, in some ways a love letter to the, to the Russia that was and the Russia that might be again, which is something I, I believe. So even though it's set in this post-Ukraine world, Ukraine is a very dark aura in the book, um, it does still have what I hope people will find a sympathetic view of the fundamentals of Russian character as we know Russia through our reading and past travels before the nightmares we're seeing now. And I want to talk in detail about our main character here, Ivan Volkov. But before we do so, just to situate listeners, could you describe uh, the general story of the novel? So the, the book opens with a scene in which Ivan Volkov, a, a Russian scientist, a, astrophysicist, um, this discovers what he believes is, a, in effect, a kill switch that the Russia and China have that will render GPS on which we depend for, you know, essentially all of our commercial and, and travel life, render that inoperable and, and bring chaos to the, to the West and to the world. And he feels that he has an obligation to share that information with the CIA. So he reaches out, anybody who goes to the CIA website can see there's a way for people who have secrets that they think matter to communicate. And he does. He sends a message saying, your world's about to go dark. Contact me. And nothing happens. And indeed, through the book, in different ways, nothing happens. Uh, people don't want to hear what he has to say. So the book opens with a riddle, in a sense. Why doesn't anybody want to listen? And then the, the book goes back to the moment at which Volkov's fascination with space begins when he's a graduate student in, in Tsinghua University in, in Beijing, of all places. He, he's dead broke. He can't pay his tuition at Moscow State University, so he's gone to China because they'll offer him a scholarship. And we encounter him there, and we see him fall in love with a young American graduate student named Edith Ryan, who we realize early on has a connection with the CIA who's there after graduating from Yale, but is, is reporting back to people in Washington. So he gets caught in a, a dilemma from, from the beginning of the book. I, I won't go into too much detail unless, unless you want, because I want people to, to read it, but we follow these characters and a Chinese who like, who like our other lead characters in, a, in some ways is just caught crossways with his system. So we have three people in three different worlds, each of them obsessed with satellite technology, who are just going at, going at the lives of their countries um, uh, crossways and, and, and struggling. And the book is a, it's a in different slices of time, uh, helps us to see how their story ends up in the present, like right now, the Ukraine war is going on and um, yeah, we should talk about this, but the Ukraine war is really the, the first satellite war, first of many. And that's another theme the book touches on. 
How did you decide to start the book kind of near the end of the story? Um, as you say, Ivan is is struggling with how to approach the CIA. Um, and so that uh, that moment really directed my focus while I was reading the book. So how did you decide to start at that point uh, at the beginning of the book? So when you're trying to tell a story um, that takes place over an arc of time, uh, question one question is how, how you want to slice the pieces of time and fit them together. Yeah, and um, I, I wanted something in, in, in the right now present that would feel immediate and visceral speaking to what you're experiencing now as a reader. And then um, to pull the camera back and help you understand the complicated story that led you to the point that, sh that you began the book with. Um, you think, think of all kinds of different ways to plot it. The, the second half of the book is a very tight narrative over a week. And I thought of structuring the book that way and then having flashbacks to the story stories of the characters so you get the richest. And I just couldn't figure out how to do it. I, sometimes flashbacks drive me nuts as a reader. It's like enough already. You know, it's going to keep me in the same time 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 slice right now. So anyway, I decided to do it that way, and, and readers will have to decide uh, whether that, that made sense. So our main character here is Ivan Volkov. Uh, you've discussed him a bit but how would you describe Volkov as a human being and as a scientist? So I think the first thing about about Volkov as a human being is that he um, is a is a disillusioned post Soviet Russian. His father was a, a party official in this town of Magnitogorsk, uh, as I said, Russia's Pittsburgh. Uh, he grew up uh, in this mill town, seeing a father who, as he says at one point, drank too much and ate too many lies, like everybody in that generation in the Soviet Union. Uh, he's a he's a brilliant young man. He wins math competitions. You know, Soviet Union is, was big on on math competitions and you know inter-republic uh, championships for this and that. Anyway. Gets a scholarship to Moscow State University. He also is a big guy. He loves to play hockey like everybody in Russia. Um, but he ends up at, at Moscow State University. He thinks he wants to study astronomy. Um, I think in terms of his his values, I won't give away a lot by saying that he falls in love initially with a woman of the new Russia. He's glamorous, sexy, um, sort of obsessed with money and what money can buy, you know, wanting one of the beautiful new apartments that now line all of the inner districts of Moscow where the oligarchs and their circle have their apartments. And um, she's disappointed with him because he doesn't really care about making money. He doesn't care about it enough. He wants to be a scientist. He wants to, to study these fascinating puzzles. Uh, he's, he's obsessed with the... the ancient medieval German astronomer Johannes Kepler and Kepler's uh, formulas for that, how to chart the motion of planetary bodies. And he you know, noodles away at, at new solutions to very traditional problems. And he has a wife who thinks that's a complete waste of time, you know, go make money. So th that's, that's who he is. I think he's a very likable, to me, he's a very likable character. He encounters increasing difficulty. There's deep sadness in his life. And he's, I think, I hope well paired with an American woman who similarly just hasn't found a way to touch the things that she wants in life. She, she's been a victim of sexual harassment in the CIA, which is a very real problem in the CIA. It surfaces occasionally in the news, but as somebody reporting on the subject, I've been hearing stories you know, for decades about, about uh, mistreatment of women. So I, that writing that character was interesting, um, complicated. Uh, so, uh, you know, these, these people, I, I, I want to say, all exhibit a kind of idealism and frustration with uh, their governments, the worlds they live in, uh, the difficulty they have as people getting everything they want out of life. I wanted to ask you about the, the subplot of gender discrimination at the CIA um, and sexual harassment. So you just said that that was based on your journalistic work, that you've seen evidence of this over time. 
Could you uh, describe that in more detail and why you thought it was important to include in this book in particular? So uh, this character, Edith Ryan, um, at the beginning of our story, uh, when she's been assigned as a young woman, uh, tasked, even though she's not formally recruited, uh, with spotting and, and developing potential assets, um, gets close to Ivan Volkov in a way that she, she re- realizes it is wrong, that, that there's a, a kind of blurring of her operational professional role and her personal emotional role. And so she pulls back from that sharply. That's kind of how we begin understanding their relationship. And, and later in her career at the agency, you know, maybe because of that experience, maybe because people who know about it manipulate her, that she is in such stressful situations where the, the, the price of being promoted, of being successful as an operations officer is to do things that she knows she shouldn't and doesn't want to, but, but does anyway. Uh, and so it's, a, it's, it's kind of the, the, one of those uh, stories that we know in the Me Too era of women you know, who try to say no and aren't listened to and uh, pay it a terrible price. I don't want to give away too much about what happens except to say that um, one of the things that was really satisfying was to think about how she as a person could be victorious in that. You know, I have heard from women at the agency stories over decades about um, really quite appalling instances where they were their their careers were uh, manipulated by men. They were being transferred for inappropriate reasons from station to station. Um, the, the instance I describe in the in the book: somebody being caught in the parking lot with a, an employee. Uh, um, somebody using drugs on a series of contacts in two different foreign capitals. Those are real stories. I don't go into all the details, but anybody who's familiar with, with uh, the legal record will recognize that this is not entirely made up. I, I think the CIA is doing uh, better at this. I think in part because they have the kinds of protections that the, my book describes my character, Edith Ryan, fighting for to protect other women. So I, I don't think it's as bad as, as it once was. I mean, being an operations officer is like, you know, it's just out there. It's, you know, it's, it's just high energy. It's, you know, high testosterone or the female, female equivalent. I mean, people, you know, are out there doing tough things. And so it's, it's an environment in which... You could say it's conducive to drinking. It's conducive to all sorts of, uh, of behaviors that get people in, in trouble. But um, uh, I, I do think the agencies tried to recognize it and understand the mental health problems, the stresses for women officers, uh, the, just all, all, all the issues that have, have made the CI sometimes not a good place. I think they're trying to make it better. Returning to Volkov, uh, you said in this conversation, and it seems clear to me in the book, that you are trying to paint a a complex picture of um, what it's like to live in the post-Soviet Russia world, and especially during the war in Ukraine. And we see in the book that Volkov has, it seems to me, some deep attachment to Russia, perhaps below the surface of uh, some other feelings that he has about it. Um, but w- what did you, w- what were you trying to get across uh, through showing that complexity? So one thing that we see uh, as we watch the Ukraine war play out is that Russians just can't sh- shake their Russianness. It seems bizarre to me, but uh, Putin is more popular today than he was when he launched this uh, I think, misconceived, damaging war against Ukraine. But obviously he's tapping something in the, in the Russian uh, character. And even though uh, Volkov, my hero, would reject a lot of that, he has a choice early in the book about whether to go back to China, which is, really wants to have him as a graduate student. He's so talented in this field. Um, or, to, or whether to stay in Russia. His mother dies. Yeah, he's there at her funeral, and he realizes 
there's just no way I'm going to leave this country where I buried my parents. So he doesn't, and he, and he tries to make a go of it. He has a son who is the thing he cherishes most in life. Um, his son, Dimitri, also illustrated, illustrates, I think, the things that um, are decent and admirable in Russia. He's, uh, believe it or not, actually tries to fight against corruption in the system. And it, it's, a, it's a whole subplot th there. But um, I, I do think, um, Matt, that we make a mistake in not understanding that Russians are deeply patriotic and that that is sometimes inexplicable given their, their leadership, but they remain attached to Mother Russia and they fight like hell. Uh, you know, think of the Napoleonic Wars, World War II, now in Ukraine. Um, uh, often under great adversity for this country that doesn't treat him very well, but they love it anyway. And yeah, it seemed to me that in a sense, Volkov was trapped by his attachment to Russia. Um, and I think entrapment is a theme that uh, that permeated throughout the book um, with respect to Volkov and Edith Ryan, uh, the, um, the USCIA officer that we've spoken about. Could you describe, was, was entrapment something um, that you envisioned uh, as kind of having a salience in this world of intelligence and space uh, th that you thought was important to convey, or did it kind of just come through the story you were telling? It emerged through the story, but I think it is implicit in, the, in, the, in this world of, of intelligence. I mean, in a sense, um, it's most... Uh, raw terms, um, intelligence officers are trying to get people to say things or do things that are illegal under their, their laws. They're not trying to entrap them necessarily. Sometimes it's an ideological appeal. You know, this is the right thing for you. This is the right thing for your family. Uh, in the case of Volkov, um, he really is self-motivated. He, he, he reaches out to the CIA after pulling back sharply in his initial encounter with Edith um, because he thinks it's the right thing to do. But um, once that process begins, people are entrapped in it. Um, they can't really know all the factors that are at play. That's in the nature of intelligence operations. You just don't know exactly what's going on. You don't know that the flag that's being waved in front of you is real or false. You don't know if the information that's motivating you to take action is accurate or a lie. Uh, I always try to remind myself that um, I want to have, I want, I'd like to see a good American intelligence service, but this is a business about lies, whatever country it is. One symbol that was interesting uh, kind of in juxtaposition to this entrapment was this uh, the symbol that you carried throughout the book of the Chinese game of Go um, that Edith Ryan is very uh, interested in and seemed, seems to have a love for. Could you describe what that uh, symbol was about in the book and why you chose to tie it through the story? So I, I should admit to, to your listeners, I am not a, a Go expert, so don't take <laughs> me too far in this conversation. So, so from what I learned in my, in my research, Go is this is this game, um, you know, like the path that Edith is finding where you're, you're seeking, um, you know, liberty, the freedom to move, move your pieces, achieve your your, your, your mission in, in the game or in which you're, you're closed, you're, you're, you're tightly bound by the other person's moves. And, and that's uh, an issue that Edith encounters. All the, the characters really encounter in different ways. We haven't talked about the Chinese character, Kao Lin, uh, much, but he's the third principal character in this book. Um, in some ways, I think he similarly is, m much as Vol Volkov embodies the dilemmas of, of a Russian, uh, Kao Lin embodies the dile dilemmas of, of a Chinese in this rapidly modernizing dynamic China uh, I'll, I'll leave to the book or to your questions if you want to ask more details about him. But he, he's also on his own go board um, looking for liberty and not finding it. So let's let's talk about Kao Lin. So who is Kao Lin? 
uh, and uh, how does he figure into your story? So Cao Lin is a, is a member of the Chinese uh, Academy of Sciences uh, who um, uh, helps oversee on behalf of the party uh, and the intelligence uh, services that he uh, reports to despite his academic uh, role. And he's, he's always, um, like intelligence professionals, always uh, trying to spot a potential talent who can be helpful. Uh, and in Volkov, this Russian who's come dead broke to Beijing to, to study and, and begins to do really quite brilliant work and uh, submit uh, his proposed answers to the dilemmas that haunted uh, the famous Johannes Kepler, he, he thinks this young man is somebody we could use. And so um, there's a complicated um, uh, dance between Kaolin and Volkov, but Kaolin also with, with his own bureaucracy. What I wanted to show through his character and, and his scenes is the way in which the Chinese um, uh, space technology uh, has expanded. You know, the book opens in 1995. By um, 10 years later, China is just rocketing forward. Uh, and he's um, on that rocket ship, if you will, but increasingly feels it's precarious. You know, I don't want to say too much more about him because he ends up being one of the biggest mysteries in the book. At one point, um, and this conversation takes place uh, in the er earlier part of the book in uh, and it's set in 1996. You, you helpfully give dates throughout the book to, to situate readers. And I thought it was a nice, uh, a, a nice framing mechanism. Anyway, so Lin says during this conversation um, that China would be a player in space because it would concentrate on making the smaller items like circuits and routers that would be needed for the operation of uh, space systems and even complex space systems. So to what extent uh, did this represent China's focus and development uh, and achievement in space? So um, let me describe uh, the setup slightly differently. So when the book opens in 1995, uh, smart Chinese uh, scientists and intelligence officers realize that space will be decisive in the future of business, warfare, every aspect of life, but they don't have anything going. I mean, they're still a developing country. They, they put up a little teeny tiny satellite that can't do anything more than play a tinny recording of the East is Red. Um, that's, that's it. I mean, they're just, they're not in the game, but they, they realize that this is so important they need to begin thinking about how to get inside America's space systems. So how would you do that? Imagine it's 1995 and you know something's going to be really important and you think 10 years from now, I want to be able to have, I want to be building the kill switch. So I thought as I was framing the novel, what you, what you do is, is think about the supply chain. You think about all the little things that go into satellite systems, you know, these dishes you see everywhere that are, you know, beaming signals up and downloading them from satellites. You'd think about the cables and routers and small computer servers that are on every uh, ground communication station. You would think of all the ways to get inside the little systems that are essential for the big systems. Uh, and I'll bet you anything that's exactly what China did. Now, how successful has it been? I, I know enough to say I'm confident that they tried it. I know some instances where they've got, they got caught, but it's always a safe bet to, to assume that um, for everything that you identify, there's probably something else you didn't. So we, <laughs> that's a way of saying we don't really know how deeply involved in our supply chain they are, but it's, we sh shouldn't assume it's, it's not at all. So I just spoke with recently with David Sanger about his new book, uh, and a lot of that book uh, is describing how the U.S. was asleep at the wheel uh, while China 
rose over the last uh, couple of decades. So, I mean, it seems now that there is a significant focus uh, on preventing um, Chinese intrusion into our supply chains, especially with respect to national security and critical infrastructure. Um, but so was w- would you say that uh, that permitting China to have this access to U.S. space systems um, was part of this broader story about the U.S. not understanding the Chinese threat, or is it distinct in some key ways? So I think as technology was moving um, forward, it was what made it so dynamic was that it was largely happening in the private sector, and it was happening in part because costs kept plummeting, and that that in, in turn happened because there was intense competition to build a cheaper router and a, you know, cheaper satellite dish and all the little components. And often it was the Chinese who were doing that. And uh, people thought, well, we're being smart because the things that really matter we'll have done in our dedicated foundries and we'll exercise appropriate controls. And I've heard an awful lot of uh, people patting themselves on the back for, you know, oh, well, we, we, we see what's coming. I, I think... Um, the Chinese did send a, a wake-up call to everyone in 2007 when they demonstrated a very primitive uh, anti-satellite weapon that just shot a rocket up in the sky and blew up a satellite, leaving a lot of debris. Very messy, but it was a statement. We get it. We, we know that satellites are important and we're going to be in this game. The Chinese since then have done ever more sophisticated things. I try to describe them in, in the book. Uh, I think... The honest truth, Matt, is that the reason the U.S. Space Force was created under President Trump was because the Air Force dropped the ball. It, it, it just didn't take space serious enough. It had, it had, it had a space command. It, it nominally was, was doing its job. But let's, let's face it, in, in the Air Force, the way you get ahead is by being a great fighter pilot and being a leader of fighter squad pilot squadron and you know being a a nerdy guy who's sitting a screen looking at objects in space was not how you were going to become a flag officer or or chief of staff of the air force so i think um although it's had real growing pains the space force is a is a good thing and um i think even even the air force would recognize that today and would you say that the institutional focus of the space force um, reflects the the real problems. In other words, are they uh, are, are 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 they elevating officers who are good at uh, sitting in front of computers and looking at uh, very small images? So it, I think it's really a dilemma uh, for the space force. Um, you know, the military ethos says that the c- commanders should be war fighters. They should be people who are prepared to, to be leaders and take decisions and, and win battles, whether they're battles in space or, or anywhere else. Uh, and, and so um, the first uh, two Space Force commanders have, have, have been very smart, uh, technologically uh, subtle, but they've also been had some of that war, warfighter ethos. I think what gives the United States special opportunities and also uh, difficulties is that what's most dynamic in our space array is actually in the private sector. Elon Musk, for all of the the difficulties, questions we have about how he runs uh, Twitter X, has been just brilliant beyond description in how he ran uh, Starlink, SpaceX, and his Starlink subsidiary. Starlink has about 5,000 satellites in orbit now. It's in a position to provide broadband internet coverage for basically every part of the world. It is the reason that Ukraine is able to continue fighting against Russia. Um, uh, Amazon is about to launch its own version of that, which will do other things related to Amazon's cloud uh, called Kuiper. Kuiper will have at least 2,000 satellites. I mean, it, the, the inventiveness, uh, dynamism of our private sector uh, space operation is dazzling. And the Russians and Chinese don't have anything remotely like it. And it scares them because every satellite 
that uh, Starlink throws up has, you know, little, um, uh, has space in which other systems uh, that have been rented out by agencies of the government, let's just leave it there, um, you know, how on earth are the Russians and Chinese going to figure out among the 5,000 Starlink satellites spinning around the globe, which ones in a time of crisis might be genuinely dangerous to them? And the truth is they can't. Um, this is, this is, it's um, in this area, I don't think people quite realize this yet. We have such an extraordinary advantage because of our private sector. And I'm glad that, you know, General Salzman's running the Space Force about time. But that's really, that's not the heart of our advantage. It's, it's in what the private sector is doing. And the private sector is a strong subplot throughout the book. And you really emphasize the importance that it has in the war in Ukraine and uh, and elsewhere in space. One uh, kind of crossover that I noticed, and maybe I'm reading too much into it, but you have a um, you have a quote at the beginning of the book before the book starts uh, by Dostoevsky uh, that says, "Neither a person nor a nation can endure without some higher idea." Um, and we see from uh, Kowlin, our Chinese scientist, and from Volkov, a uh, Russian scientist. Uh, that there's this real love for scientific discovery. And we also see that um, among some of the private sector actors, uh, especially uh, when they're communicating with Edith Ryan at points. Um, so what, what, what message of uh, kind of scientific and perhaps economic freedom were you meaning to tell in this story? So um, I think what that quote says to me or, or reminds me of is that as countries become increasingly um, dependent on brilliant individuals in this world where space and space systems will, will be dominant, um, and we have especially brilliant private entrepreneurs, um, Musk is one, my boss, Jeff Bezos, obviously, is another you know, you, there are dozens of people now in the space area who just are incredibly uh, brilliant and, and AI as well. There is this question, this question that Dostoevsky asks, what higher purpose is it that they serve? And uh, a simple way to, to put this that, that's not in terms of um, citizenship but, you know, do they serve the, the values of, of freedom and independence of thought? Do they serve the, the kind of the idea of, the, of a better world that's anchored, I think, in, in Western and, and Eastern um, philosophy? Uh, do, they, do they seek the good? Because, you know, if, if, if these people decide, I mean, what happens if, I said earlier, Elon Musk is providing all of the, the uh, internet that allows the Ukrainian army to survive in the field. What if Elon Musk one day wakes up and says, I'm sick of these forever wars. You know, the Ukrainians, the hell with it. I've got business interests in China and Russia, you know, and, and pulls the plug. I mean, that would be really terrible. So um, it's a complicated question of how, how, how our government or any government should deal with that. But maybe for me, the starting point was just to think about what Dostoevsky and so many others would say about uh, anchoring everything we do in values. So another uh, brilliant scientist uh, we have in the story is Edith Ryan. We've discussed her trajectory. So at, at one point in the book, she starts to make a series of mm -hmm. discoveries about uh, the Chinese and I believe Russian militaries. Um, yeah, it's it's both. Uh, so could you could you describe um, whether those discoveries reflect? real ones that the U.S. government has made um, in in space. I'm especially interested in, in two examples. One was the, the Chinese experimental attack satellite that you describe, and the other um, is this, uh, this Russian doll, th this satellite that mimics a Russian doll where one comes out of another. I have read about that one uh, in the news, and I know that China has some uh, experimental attack satellites, but uh, so d did those discoveries that Edith made represent real ones? And could you take us through uh, the substance of, of some of those discoveries and technologies? So um, 
I'm not very good at making things up. Um, so uh, each of the uh, satellite capabilities that I you just described that are that are in the book that that Edith is researching are are drawn from real examples. I say in the acknowledgments that um, I depended heavily on the Center for Strategic and International Studies um, annual summary of space threats, which is very detailed. Uh, in particular, about about the two that you mentioned. So, so the Chinese have demonstrated an ability to uh, have a satellite that is a hunter that begins exploring in geocentric orbit, the upper band of, of orbit where the satellite stays in, a, in effect stationary over over the area it covers to 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 wander in that in that area and then. Um, uh, you know, it has an arm with it that could be used to take a satellite out of orbit, to move it into a different orbit. It presumably would have other capabilities. Satellites today could carry high-powered microwaves that could inject code if they got close enough without ever touching the satellite. I could use lasers to dazzle or, or otherwise compromise the satellite. So uh, the, the Chinese have, have had some amazing experiments, which we've monitored, which Edith is describing for people to say, "Hey, wake up! You know this is what they this is what they're doing right now." She's tracking these satellites. She's going to work for a, a, a private uh, uh, sort of think tank, a public private think tank. Same thing with the Russians. The Russians do have a Matryoshka doll satellite where the satellite goes up uh, into upper Earth orbit, kind of checks things out, and then pop. Uh, a little satellite comes out of the big satellite, which is the sort of uh, the hunter, as, as I imagine it. And then there's this potentially killer, the satellite that could go in and, and, and take out in various ways its target. Another amazing thing that's in the book, um, again, drawn from life. You can, you can go watch the, the, the videos of this that have been captured uh, on the Internet if you want. Um, there's something... Uh, that uh, space scientists call the graveyard zone, which is where satellites that have been in geocentric orbit way up there, but have exhausted their useful life. They've run out of power. Their systems of various sorts don't, don't work anymore. So, so they fire themselves finally or, or are you know, kicked by some other propulsion into the, the far reaches of space, the graveyard zone, where they go to die. But guess what? We have detected a Chinese satellite that appeared to be dead up there in the graveyard zone that came back to life, that started powering up again after some period of being dormant. And it's like a zombie in, in the graveyard. The zombie came back uh, towards uh, targets that it might, it might seek. It was just really a sort of stunner of all the stuff that you think you know uh, what it is in space that might be something very different. So um, that's one example of why I think this is so interesting. A big thing that the Space Force is doing now is simply building the capability to do reconnaissance of what's up there, what's alive and what's dead, what uh, energy is being used. Um, but I just uh, I want your listeners to think of the graveyard zone and whether there, there are zombies floating around in that graveyard zone. What would be, I, I was wondering this while I was reading the book, um, what would be the purpose of that? So they, they send these uh, these uh, items that were formerly useful, they go to the graveyard zone, and then they come back. But is, is it is it that, is, is the hope that uh, the U.S. would lose sight of it and then wouldn't be monitoring um, a particular satellite, but then it would be... Um, it would then be again useful, uh, but then it would be more useful because it would be at this point secret. Is that the idea? I think that's the idea um, that you that you have objects that you could um, mobilize. It's it's like you know um, militaries often try to have stay behind networks. If you evacuate an area, you'll try to have caches of weapons and ammunition. People um, who will um, you know at the call suddenly. Uh, you know, spring up uh, as as fighters um, and give you the ability to, to surprise your adversary. I, I'm assuming that was the intention, or at least to demonstrate that capability. 
as you suggest, given the increasingly advanced ability to monitor uh, objects in space. And I must say the application of large language models, you know, when you begin to see the little littlest bit of propulsion, the ability to project where that object is likely to go is going to be enormous. Um, so it may not be as great a strategy as you, as you once thought. But um, these examples just explain why I think space is really cool. I just think it, it's, it's so interesting to think about. It is a frontier of warfare, which is super scary. But just, just in, you know, for people who are interested in, in, in weapon systems, how they work, what the dangers are, how to curb those dangers, uh, there's, there's, it's just it's really ripe territory. I feel lucky to have written this book before it became so ob- you know, stunningly obvious that this was something worth paying attention to. I want to return to the war in Ukraine, which we've we've referenced but haven't addressed in detail. What was the story you were trying to tell about uh, the war in Ukraine through the eyes of Ivan Volkov and others? So, uh, f- first, there's just the, the the technical side of what um, Starlink and other companies have have done, and the frustration of the Russians and their Chinese friends. Um, in, in trying unsuccessfully to, to cope with that. So I've seen uh, demonstrations of systems that allow the Ukrainians, I've sat with Ukrainian military officers as they use these systems, allow them to look at every commercial satellite that's orbiting Ukraine or more specifically uh, Crimea. And those satellites include optical imaging satellites that are like the NRO's old, you know, spy satellites that give you resolution down to a few millimeters. You can see objects with great clarity on the ground. They include thermal imaging satellites. So if there's cloud cover, you can see through the clouds and you can see um, things that are moving. They include um, simple SIGINT satellites. So you actually can hear signals. They include um, other kinds of, you know, measurement satellites. So you can tell from the explosion uh, what um, what millimeter shell is being fired. You can probably tell what kind of artillery piece. Um, you have AI applications that will allow you to look at um, you know, very uh, fragmentary data, things moving through forests, let's say, and identify with some certainty whether that's a T-72 tank or not. So um, all of that can be dialed down by Ukrainian commanders just drawing on commercial feeds. They can say, I want, I want to contact two more companies that have satellites in space to get more coverage of Crimea in the next 24 hours because uh, you know, I, have, I have a particular interest in that. So um, uh, I could go on, but that, 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 the, the technical side of what um, satellite commercial satellite technology can do for Ukraine is, is, is pretty amazing. The Russians have become a learning army. Their satellite constellation is nothing like ours, and they're afraid of what we can do to the point that a Russian ambassador at the UN in late 2022, when the war had been going on for six months, and it was pretty obvious how important this stuff was, Russian ambassador, his name is Vorontsov, said at the UN, these are legitimate military targets, meaning, you know, we could, we, they take these damn satellites out. Uh, we don't have anything to compete with them. And, and, they're, and they're, we're not going to be permanently uh, in, in second place here. You may remember, your listeners will remember, that the Congressman Mike Turner in February asked the, the whole Congress to be briefed on a, what he said was a severe national security threat that turned out to be a Russian system uh, for sort of the ultimate space disaster where they where they needed to take out everything in space and they would explode a nuclear weapon in space and just blow everything in the, the low earth orbit belt up, which sounds like an insane, I think is an insane uh, approach, but their feeling is that there is such a, a radical difference between our dependence on these systems and their limited dependence because they're not very good at them. That, that they'd be willing to pay that price. So um, 
you know, that's a little bit of the background of, of the Ukraine war. As I say, I think um, when you step back, you'll see, people will see Ukraine is the first space war. Um, the space side that has advantage has been Ukraine, thanks to us and our companies and our entrepreneurs like Elon Musk. But the rest of the world is going to catch up. I mean, they're going to people. This is a demonstration, just as the first Gulf War was. First Gulf War taught everybody about the importance of precision weapons, and everybody followed. Um, you know, it's, this is a drone war. Don't think that drones won't operate in every battle space on the planet in the future because of what people are sort of watching in Ukraine. And the, that quote was striking. Um, you include it in the book from the Russian official. So, how has the U.S. sought to ensure that uh, the use of these technologies isn't perceived as, or the, the provision of these technologies isn't perceived as uh, an escalatory measure uh, that brings the U.S. to a level of involvement where it doesn't, that, that it doesn't want to have in this war? So I don't think it's done much of that, to be honest. The view uh, among defense officials, uh, a lot of the commercial people in this area is that we're playing catch up, that the Chinese were very early with their explosion of an anti-satellite device in 2007, back when, you know, we, we were still depending on an air force dominated by fighter pilots. Um, their first Chinese patents on high powered microwaves, which I think are a technology of enormous importance uh, in the future of space were, were filed, I believe in 2000. 10 or 11, the Chinese have been, have been, and some of these technologies have been very, very smart um, in, 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 you know, making early inventions and how they develop the technologies, we, we just, we don't know. But they're becoming a, a space power of the first order. What they don't have is our entrepreneurial ecosystem to, to just radically accelerate the development and drive down costs. Uh, on that, they just they don't seem able to tolerate a world where where entrepreneurs make money and you know be like they don't they don't like Jack Ma. Jack Ma seems to be the enemy of the state. I don't know why he's the most effective Chinese entrepreneur of of, of this of the century, but he's on the outs. This Wednesday, we heard a, a senior DoD official say that Russia is developing an anti satellite nuclear device, which is uh, the device that. Uh, Rep, Rep Turner was referencing earlier. Um, so, and, and uh, the DOD official, uh, John Plum, said that if this device was used, it could make low Earth orbit unusable for up to a year. Um, and this also comes as Russia on Wednesday vetoed a UN resolution calling for states to work to avert a nuclear arms race with respect to space. So, what is the US doing to constrain? Russian space development and uh, these actions that um, seem precarious? So the honest answer, Matt, is I don't know. Um, I, I know that um, there's increasing public discussion about this Russian threat, although, let's be honest, that was forced by Mike Turner, a Republican member of Congress. Um, one problem that anybody who's interested in this area encounters is that this is the most classified area of defense um, technology that, that I'm aware of. I mean, it's, it's really hard to find out reliable information. And I think um, that's become counterproductive because the US, I mean, what, what are we going to do about Russia's um, threats to weaponize space in this particularly dangerous way with, with nuclear weapons? Um, the only answer is deterrence, which means making the Russians aware of the capabilities we have that would render such attacks futile. But you can't, as 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 a very senior defense official said to me a year ago, you can't deter in the dark. Meaning, you can't deter without saying something about what your own capabilities are. So I hope there'll be a little bit more of that. The fact that you had Plum on him, mean, he's like the big guy in this area. That that's good. He should be. He should be um, talking. I'll go back and listen. Listen to what he ha had to say. My own feeling is that the Russian uh, uh, apparent consideration of using a nuclear weapon uh, to 
blow low Earth orbit satellites out of the sky just shows how how limited their capabilities are. I mean, that, that really is just using a sledgehammer to pound a nail. It's crazy. Um, the things that they should do if they had the capabilities would be to develop systems that can interfere with the ability of satellites to communicate with each other. The, the, you know, Starlink has a kind of mesh net in space. It has its own internet in space. So those satellites can communicate with each other on their own mesh net before they send signals back to Earth. It becomes very difficult to block those signals or even know. So that's what a smart adversary would be trying to do is figure out technologies that could um, uh, interfere with, impede, disrupt uh, uh, communications like that and not, not blow up a nuclear weapon. But um, I, I just think, as, as I say, the, we have a treaty out, outlawing the use of nuclear weapons in space. We're increasing in an era where treaties that are written um, seem like invitations uh, to, 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 to violate them, uh, to ignore them. And the U.S. has had a desire to have talks about strategic stability with Russia and China. This is a perfect example of where you need to have that. I mean, you know, this would be catastrophic for everybody. It'd be especially catastrophic for us. But other people will catch up to us. They'll be as dependent on space before long, next 10, 20 years, as we are now. Um, so, uh, David Ignatius, what is next for you after Phantom Orbit? What are you, what, what can we, what can eager readers expect from you next? So, um, I am, I'm working on a, uh, an expanded version of a novel that was serialized in the Washington Post last summer about the competition between the U S and, and Chinese intelligence services, which has gone radically in China's favor. China has ripped apart American spy networks in China. And how did that happen? And what is the U.S. doing about it? I'm going to turn that into a full 100,000 word novel. And then I'm working on another novel about Russian intelligence operations that are ongoing every day in ways we do not understand, ways that are genuinely dangerous, that could kill people inside the United States. So I'm working on those two. And as usual, try somehow to get my two columns a week written in a way that, that don't embarrass me or the paper. One one question I, I had actually about that is about your workflow. So, I mean, it, it seems from the outside that you would have one of the more interesting and idiosyncratic workflows in, in Washington. So what is what does that look like? What what does a typical week look like while you're um, you're, you're burning through novels and you're, you're writing your columns. So what I've found about uh, writing, um, and I'd say this about both journalistic and, and fiction writing, is that it comes from the preconscious. And so um, when a, a novel really has taken root, when the characters are fully alive, when I'm in, in that story, it just takes over. It just crowds out everything else that, that I, you know, fall asleep thinking about it. I dream about it. I wake up thinking about it. So I, I try um, to, to segment my time. So, you know, one or two days a week, I'll go full bore on writing my columns, or maybe sometimes I'll tell the post, I just can't write a column this week. But I, fi I find similarly for, for journalism, um, although the research is highly conscious, you know, the interviewing, the stacking up facts. I'm like a, a little, make little lists and check out. But then when the, you actually write, um, you just strap in. And I love, I'm a big fan of deadlines because, uh, you know, deadlines, you don't have time to think about it. It just kind of comes to you. So that's how I do it. I, 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 I'm a just in time guy. I love deadlines. I do that in my fiction as well as in my, uh, in my journalism. And, uh, you know, the, the final thing to say for anybody who ever thinks about, gosh, what would it be like to write a novel? So I didn't know anything about writing a novel. You know, my first, my first novel, every single publisher I sent it to turned it down. It's often with elaborate, condescending uh, letters telling me that, you know, how silly that you, so, but you can, you can learn how to do it. And it gives the greatest pleasure. I mean, the, the ability to kind of ruminate about things, people, um, and it's not, you're not really writing it, um, 
to make money because you're never a crapshoot. You have no idea. Uh, um, or even so much to be read by others. It's the, it's the act of that world that comes alive in your own consciousness. So uh, if lawfare readers, you know, will put aside their, their law books and, and take out their <laughs> Dostoevsky, I hope, I hope they'll join me in this and, you know, shoot me an email if they have something they want me to, to, to talk about. That's sage advice. And to conclude, as is tradition on uh, chatter, I have a question for you from our chatter box. Apart from uh, space, which uh, you you explored um, in this book, what what is the most salient national security issue that listeners should be focused on, um, perhaps over the next 10 to 20 years and not, not as uh, Im- immediately? So I'll give the standard uh, answer, which is uh, the radical evolution of, of AI and, and large language models. Um, what I find when I talk to the best scientists in this area is that they can't predict with confidence how quickly aspects of this technology will advance. I mean, large language models got smarter, if you will, much faster than people who were, who were designing them expected. And I think the same may be true of uh, artificial general intelligence, you know, this sort of super intelligence that will link different large language models together and produce this astonishing um, uh, computational and, and other set of abilities. How will state, I see all the good sides of that, but I see uh, all the ways in which, in which governments will insist we must apply this, these technologies to defense. And, um, you know, that's, that scares me. I'm going to be trying to do as much journalism initially as I can about that, but I'd be surprised if a novel didn't come out. Well, we will be waiting for it. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, Matt. That was Chatter, a production of Lawfare and Goat Rodeo. Please subscribe to the podcast and find us on Twitter at That Was Chatter. 